Welcome to Student Communication, part of our Impactful Technology Use series. I'm Sandy Kendall, and along with Charlotte Larson and Heather Solis, we've designed this course and hope you enjoy your learning. Let's think for a moment. When we hear the word communication, what do we think about? Do you think about speaking, listening, viewing, understanding? There are many, many facets to communication. Here's a quote that might help us think about it. The two words information and communication are often used interchangeably, but they signify quite different things. Information is giving out. Communication is getting through. Of all our inventions for mass communication, pictures still speak the most universally understood language. Let's hear a few thoughts from educators on the importance of communication in learning. Now, let's hear from educators who've extended their curriculum with activities that help make students better communicators. It's important that students learn to communicate while learning and creating in the 21st century because it provides them opportunities to share their thinking and share their ideas through different mediums of communication, whether it's print, uh, digital, video, audio, so many different ways that they can share their ideas and share their voices. Communication is essential to collaboration and collaboration is at the heart of every successful business, of most successful projects, unless you're doing it completely alone. We need to be able to resolve problems with people we work with. We need to be able to share our, our own ideas effectively. We need to be able to be good listeners. So communication is, is critical to, to all the learning that our students do and all the work that they're going to do in the future. Being able to communicate effectively is probably the most important of all life skills. It allows us to pass along information and also for us to understand what's being said to us. Great communicators, they drive change. They motivate, they inspire, they bring solutions. Great communicators are change makers. I think it's really important for students, regardless of age, to learn how to communicate as far as with 21st century learning, because we've been doing so many things online now and the students be able to need to collaborate and share ideas because that's where education is moving in the future and that's where our workforce is moving in the future. Our world is all about communication and connectivity and as this world shrinks, the communication is even more essential that's clear because now we're talking about communicating with various cultures, uh, various people around the world. If you have those communication skills, you know how to filter through and learn how to communicate effectively the big idea and the point that you're trying to get across and bring people together. So communication is extremely essential as we move into the 21st century. The importance of communication in all student learning is and always has been paramount, but they are becoming increasingly visual experts. Their visual literacy is, they're bombarded with, not only in television and film, but on their computers and their games. And it's important that they learn how to use their knowledge in ways that demonstrates their understanding. So we can see the importance of communication from educator perspectives, and I'm sure that you have a lot of those same feelings. One of the things that we have been emphasizing in these impactful technology use sessions that we've created this summer is this impactful technology use rubric. You can see that students use technology to thoughtfully cross borders, connect with experts, local and global, and share what they have learned orally and writing and through a variety of media. Example skills include giving a presentation to a specific audience, sharing work or ideas online, including with people outside of school, expressing their ideas for a specific audience through writing, expressing their ideas a different way than writing. As you look at the rubric, think about how often do your students do this? I bet they do it a lot in writing, but is that the only medium they're using? 
Remember, our rubric says a variety of media. So are they using video and audio in addition to writing? And are they using it on a regular basis? Aiming for communication through a variety of media at least once a week is a really good goal to have. And by a variety, we mean more than just writing. Are they using video? Are they using audio? Fortunately, there are some very easy ways to incorporate those things into your learning. And students have all the tools they need right in front of them with their Chromebook to accomplish these things. So some quick wins in this area include explaining or applying their learning. On this slide, I have some examples from elementary where students might quickly record for you an explanation of something they've done in science, how they're solving a problem in math, a review of a book or a poetry or text, or maybe describing a process in art. I won't show all of these to you in this video, but I encourage you to open the slides, which are also included in our Google Classroom, and take a look at some of these examples. Think of ways that your students could do these same things in your classroom. In the beginning, there might take a little bit of time to learn the tools you want them to use. In this case, these were all created in Seesaw, but after a week or two, students are gonna understand how to use the tools on their own. Let's watch a quick example of this math problem. Hi, I'm going to tell you how you can make a subtraction fact using the number lines. I'm going to, first you need to start with a two digit number and then minus a one digit number. I'm going to choose 14 and then the one digit number I'm going to use is eight. Then, I just start with the 8, and I know that 8 plus 2 equals 10, so I'll put hop, jump, 2, and then I'll put a plus 2. Then, I'm going to try to go to 14, and I know 10 plus 4 equals 14, so I'm going to hop, jump, 4, plus 4. And then, all I have to do is add up 4 plus 2, and then he got my answer. Four, five, six. It would equal six. That's how you use a number line with a subtraction fact. So you can see how much you learn about a student's understanding of a process by watching that video. So it's a bonus. You're seeing where they're at in their learning, plus they are practicing important communication skills. In secondary, here are some examples that you might use. These were all created with Screencastify Submit, which is a tool that our teachers have access to. I don't have actual recordings, but these are examples of things you can ask your students to do and record on their screen. For example, a scientific observation. In this assignment, I ask my students to record step three of today's experiment as they perform it, and then explain whether or not a chemical reaction occurred and what evidence or lack of evidence they're using to draw their conclusion. Think about the kinds of skills students are practicing by doing something like this. They're practicing their communication, which is important. They're also practicing specifically communicating scientific observations with the facts that go with their observation, and they're giving you insight into their understanding and learning. You could actually quickly identify misconceptions if they are not correctly identifying whether or not there was a chemical reaction. I encourage you to look at the slides for examples from other curricular areas. Here's a few more ideas. You can have students record reflections on their learning. Just a quick exit ticket type thing. What did they learn today? What questions do they still have? How can they apply the learning? 
If you have students do activities like a think pair share or other discussions, have them record it instead of just saying it amongst themselves. That way you can understand what they're talking about as well as them practicing their communication skills. Ask students to create video tutorials about concepts and processes in your subject. Sometimes students understand better when they hear another student explaining something. You could create a library of these tutorials to use with future students or with other students in your class. Students can also create tutorials for younger age groups. It's kind of a sneaky way to get your kids to review skills that they learned before but might need to bone up on. And in LOAT or dual language classes, video is an awesome way to practice language. Students can have conversations in their non-native languages, or if you are in a dual language situation and there's a you have a Spanish language day and an English language day, have them converse in the language of the day. This gives everyone practice that's really important that they might not otherwise get. A more in-depth way to encourage student communication is digital storytelling. There are examples on this slide of multiple digital stories. I will play a short one for you. I may not play it all the way through, but I'll encourage you to go back and take a look at these stories in our slideshow. Digital storytelling is what you're going to practice later in our course. Look closely at this image from the early 20th century and you will see what appears to be young children getting ready to take a ride on a train. Look closer and you might wonder where their parents are and why there are so many children with so few adults. These youth were riding what was known as an orphan train. I first learned about the orphan trains while scrolling through Facebook. I saw a post from one of my friends who said that her grandmother's episode from a documentary on the orphan trains was going to air on PBS. This piqued my curiosity. Then there was another post and another one. That one said her grandmother was the last orphan rider on the train. I set off to learn what exactly the orphan trains were. After seeing my friend's post, I noticed that she was sharing from another page, Riders on the Orphan Train. As I clicked through the links, I found the picture of her grandmother, Beatrice Flanagan Foytick, who came to Seeley, Texas on an orphan train from New York's Foundling Hospital. She was just 14 months old. Miss Foytick is now 97 years old. She was interviewed for a CBS Sunday morning special about the orphan trains, but the podcast is not yet available. As I clicked through further, I was brought to the Riders on the Orphan Train website. Here I found a website showcasing two individuals who have spent the last two decades traveling and educating others on the orphan train movement through song, audio-visual presentations, vintage photographs, and original interviews from orphan writers. Allison Moore and Phil Lancaster are a novelist and humanities scholar. They have chosen to bring to the public's attention a widely unknown plight of the children of the early 20th century. Here they are pictured with Miss Foytek at the Wharton County Historical Society. So what were the orphan trains and who were the writers? Orphan trains originated in New York City and traveled throughout the... So we'll pause for now. I encourage you to watch the entire orphan train video when you get a chance. But what I hope you noticed were some things like, this wasn't just a rote report. What is an orphan train? The storyteller in this video gave us some background on how she became interested in the topic. She will then go into facts about the orphan trains, but think about how a personal connection or personal application makes the learning a little more sticky, not to mention makes the communication more sticky. I was interested in how she came to be interested in the orphan trains, not just in the orphan trains themselves. Another type of a digital story is a personal narrative. And to be fully transparent, I'm gonna share with you a digital story I made actually 10 years ago. Now, the reason I didn't make a new one is because I wanted to show you what my first effort 
and making a digital story was. Notice I'm not in the video myself at all. I have only one personal photo I believe that I was able to put my hands on in order to create the story. So you can create these stories with found pictures as long as they're copyright okay and you don't have to put yourself on camera to tell a digital story. My story is short, just two minutes. A path I did not initially plan to take led me to a career I love. This story is about the early experiences that formed my EdTech journey. When I started teaching in the early 90s, Computers were not common in classrooms, but my school had an ancient Apple II computer lab. I was comfortable with Apple computers, so I braved the cobbled together lab to give my students what I felt was important computer experience. I obtained my first email account, and soon I was lugging my Mac up to school, taking the telephone off the wall, and plugging in my modem. My students started trading emails about literature with students hundreds of miles away. It was engaging for the students to share their thoughts and get feedback from an audience beyond ourselves. By the late 1990s, we had an internet-connected computer in our classroom, a web of information at our fingertips. I started teaching my students about web searching every chance I got. I learned how to create a web page and began posting class information. I saw the potential of the medium for publishing to a wider audience, and as a result, my students became some of the first in our school to create and publish their work to the web. It was the year 2000, and my kids were sharing their learning with the world. A desire to share what I was learning about instructional technology integration with my colleagues grew, so I left my classroom position and became a campus technology facilitator. I devoured any EdTech information I could and became intentional in seeking to become the instructional technology specialist I am today. I'm grateful for the opportunities I had to integrate technology in the classroom and that it led me to a career I immensely enjoy. Okay, so there you go. Me being vulnerable, sharing my very first digital story. I hope that's encouraging to you as you are about to create a digital story yourself. So in the next module of this course, we're going to ask you to dig deep and create your own digital story. Your story will be three to five minutes long on any topic you choose. You can do a personal narrative, kind of like the story I just shared with you. It could be a personal journey, an important time in your life, or overcoming a challenge. I have a link in the slides to more examples of personal digital story narratives. It could also be a curricular topic, but just be careful that it is more than a report or a screencast. Think about the Orphan Trains video I started sharing with you, how there was personal connection. And that personal connection may not be like the one in the story that one was telling, but it could just be Here's how I became interested in the topic, or I am telling you about Abraham Lincoln, but here are some things about his growing up that remind me about my growing up, or here's an interesting story and here's how it connects to the world outside of school. Find that personal hook that would make the learning sticky if someone were watching your story or would just draw them in to hear the whole thing. And as you're creating, we're going to ask you to reflect a little bit. We want you to enjoy the actual process, but think about what skills are you gaining or practicing? How would a project like this impact your students' learning? What skills would your students be gaining or practicing? And in your module, we're going to ask you to share your story to a Padlet so everyone in the class can see it. Is sharing the final product to an audience beyond the teacher or class important? Why or why not? In what ways are students already using video in their lives, creating or consuming, and how can creating digital stories help them become better creators or consumers? What scaffolds might you need to provide ahead of a digital storytelling assignment? And how could your digital learning coach be a thought partner or resource 
when designing a digital storytelling project. We are very excited to see your stories. Please do not hesitate to reach out to one of us if you have questions. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your learning. Thank you.